case you're new and curious about what we do here at Branch Line is we like to study the Bible around here on Sundays. Um, and we recently started a series in the book of Philippians, right? We've spent the past four weeks learning from, well, Acts 16 for the first two weeks, right? Which is the story of Paul when he first comes to Philippi. And then this story is interesting because it was persecutions, beatings, being imprisoned. And yet through that, a new church started. Paul created that first church in Roman territory. And then, over the past two weeks, we got through two verses of Philippians. Yay! Right? Um, today we're going to get through at least one more, I swear. Maybe two. We'll see how we go, right? Uh, so let's jump into today. It's uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8. Ooh, that's like five of them. Philippians 1, 3 to 8. Paul writes this. Every time I think of you, this church in Philippi, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we continue reading this letter from Paul to this church in Philippi in the first century, Father, we just center in on Paul's idea of joy. And Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that your joy would come into our lives, that we would open ourselves up to that, that we would make choices to receive more and more of that in our life. And Father, we need your help. We need your help to not get distracted away from that joy, we need your help to focus on what's important. And Father, we need your help in remaining and looking at and doing what you want us to do in this life to find that joy. And Father, we just pray you would prepare our hearts for this message today, for your words to us, that it would bear fruit this week. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy. Gratitude. A yearning by Paul to express these to the church in Philippi. He says, I make my request for all of you with joy, Paul says. Greek word here is chara. It means joy in the Greek. Gladness. This word and its different forms will appear 14 times in the book of Philippians. Now, I told you last week there's 104 verses in Philippians. So 14 times this word or its verb is going to appear. That's about one out of every seven verses is going to have joy in it. This is the centerpiece of Paul's letter to the Philippians. His joy in knowing them. His joy in being partners in the gospel with them. His joy at what God is doing in their life. If you wanted the main idea of the entire letter to the Philippians, it's this. Have joy even in adversity. In all things, good and bad. And Paul had a lot to be joyful about with this church in Philippi, right? They had accepted him back in Acts 16. The gospel had spread to them. They had sent him money while he was away from there to support him as he traveled around spreading the gospel to other towns. And we'll find out they took care of him while he is currently in jail in Rome. Throughout his work, they had responded to Jesus' messages and they had supported him in spreading that gospel message. There was joy there at that partnership. But Paul also had many reasons not to be joyful if he wanted to find them, right? As we'll learn in this letter, Paul is in prison. He's awaiting a charge that could lead to his execution. And the Philippians, as we studied, are living in a Roman colony full of ex-military officers who had retired. 
They were under persecution because as Christians who rejected the cult of Caesar, they defied the laws and customs of Rome. That's why Paul was arrested in Acts 16. And look, the military is not going to be okay with you rejecting the government, right? Paul and the Philippians sought to be joyful despite these circumstances. Now, church, let's be honest. Um, and I don't know about all of you. Maybe you got this figured out. But when circumstances around me aren't joyful, I'm not joyful. Right? Am I alone in that? No? Okay. In fact, I get kind of cranky. Sorry, Kristen. <laughs> I walk around muttering to myself, right? I'm doing the fights in my head. I'm like, arr, 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 and stomping and, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Like, I'm not even a joy to be around all the time. And I get kind of short with people when I'm out of patience and I'm stressed, right? Are we meant to be joyful no matter what? Should we always be walking around kind of like with this smile on our face, right? Like, hakuna matata, ain't no path, right? Or if you're a little bit older, don't worry, be happy. (laughs) Yep, thank you. Worship team, joining it. Or uh, if you grew up in church, right? I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Okay. This is why I am not on the worship team, by the way. (laughs) Lots of fun songs with this idea of joy, right? But here's the thing. Joy is not the absence of difficulties. Rather, it's this mindset we have even in difficulties. It's a way of being and doing things in this world, even if things are difficult. And Paul points to a few things in this section. First, if you want joy, Paul says, find things to be thankful for. Paul could have written how bad prison was, or he could have grumbled about the government and how wrong they were. Politic, you're right. Or any of the other multitude of bad things in his life. But instead, Paul writes and he chooses to look at the things he could be thankful for. In verse 3, he says he's thankful for his partners in spreading the good news of Christ. Paul knows that he and the people in Philippi are planting the word of God into people's hearts. They are growing the kingdom of God on a daily basis. And no amount of prison or persecution can take that joy away from them. In verse 6, he says he's thankful for God's work in their lives, that God had been growing them in maturity, and they've taken strides in their faith to follow Jesus. Church, no amount of prison or persecution could take away that growth within them. And that faith will one day find them fully remade when Christ returns. The ultimate joy. Right, church? What steals our joy away from us is that we too often focus on the things that we don't have or the things that make us afraid, worried, anxious, angry. Climate change, does that make you worry? You feel some joy about that? I mean, maybe when it's 71 in winter, right? But when drought comes in the summer, maybe not, right? Or how about politics? Anyone looking forward to this year at all, <laughs> Right? Or how about, if you're a scientist, the inexorable movement of the universe to a complete state of entropy, void of heat and life? Yay! You know, the small things. I was kind of weird as a kid. Like, that was the things that fascinated me. Very morbid stuff, right? Don't worry, I talked with a good therapist. We're good now. But Paul, (laughs) we hope I'm good. But Paul, in his joy, right, is expressing thanks, right? And when he expresses thanks, what does he find, church? joy. It's a cycle that keeps feeding himself. The more things that you can focus on to be thankful for, the more joy you will feel in your life. And the more joy you have in your life, guess what? You're now thankful for more. But if you focus on things that you don't have, or you worry about, or you fear, guess what? The less joy you'll have in life. And the less joy you have in life, guess what? curmudgeon time, right? You're going to start focusing more on the things that sap your joy. It's a negative cycle. Second, if you want to find joy, find purpose. The occasion of this letter is that the Philippians sent a messenger who brought money to Paul while he was in prison. And that messenger also stayed near Paul's prison, making sure Paul had food and cared for him. 
Now, Paul could have thanked the church of Philippi for that gift, right? You would maybe expect in this letter that he would open up saying, hey guys, thanks for the gift. I really enjoyed being able to eat. That was awesome, right? But notice Paul words carefully. He says he has joy, but it's not because of the gift they sent. But it was because of how the gospel was being advanced among them. How they were partnering with him in that gospel. You see, inherent in Paul's worldview, his attitude, his mindset, and a necessary component for joy was to continue to focus on his purpose in life. And Paul's purpose is to spread the gospel. In prison, as we'll find later in this letter, Paul continued to teach the gospel, even to Caesar's household. Just like in Acts 16, right? When Paul was in prison, what did he do at midnight? Sang hymns. Prayed. He was finding the purpose for his prison stay. And he was filled with the grace of God, especially to the jailer, who eventually became part of the family of God. And look, Paul's doing the same thing in this letter. And this is 15 years later after Acts 16. At the end of last year, church, we had a series on purpose and mission. Y'all remember it? Foundational stuff? Yeah? Well, if you're new here and you don't remember exactly word for word what was said during all those weeks, let me go over it again for you. Our purpose here at this church is to love God and love others. This we can do and we can find our purpose in no matter our circumstances. Whether we're hungry, whether we're facing debt, whether we're struggling with relationships, we can find ways to love God and love others through it all. And our mission is to connect people to a growing relationship with Jesus. To see new believers come to know Jesus. And to see all of us as believers grow in our faith. And church, I swear, we can do this even if politics go haywire. We can do this if the world is burning around us. We can do this if unfettered capitalism is ruining the American way of life for most Americans. You know, the small stuff, right? Stay focused on the purpose and mission that God has for you, and you will find joy no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. And third, church, if you want joy, you need to find deeper relationships. You see, Paul wasn't finding joy in some abstract idea. He didn't read that new self-help book that made him come to a new realization, right? Paul found joy in his deeper community with fellow believers in Jesus. He found joy in relationships. He, that's my son, Noah. He lived with these people, right, in Philippi. They knew the trials he went through. They supported him financially, prayerfully, emotionally. He prayed for them, and he gave of himself for their sake. He wrote them letters. They wrote some back. I know nowadays we can do emails, right? But like, they sent a messenger hundreds of miles to spend time with Paul. And when they were together, they broke bread at the communion. And they remembered Jesus' sacrifice together. Church, I know we've joked about this, but there's a certain beauty that the early church members in the first century would sell all of their possessions and move in together, right? Like, you want deep community. Do that. Right? Can you imagine some of the other people like waking up before their coffee and their grogginess and stuff? Like we get like semi put together people by the time they get to church, right? But imagine them before they're, you know, caffeinated. And they were sharing everything and they were living together in sort of this like new Christian hippie commune thing. And Americans suck at this, right? We each live in our own houses. And between work and family obligations and trying to upkeep our own homes and then catching up on our hobbies and shows and news on our phones, how many of us actually have time for those deep connections with others? Some of us, we only really hang out with fellow believers on Sunday mornings. Sometimes not even every Sunday, right, church? This is not a recipe for joy. It's a recipe for loneliness. If you want joy, church, you need to spend time with fellow believers. And probably more time than you think. You need to engage in life with them. Share your life with them. Learn the deeper things about them. You can't do that with everyone at the church, right? But you can do that with a handful of people at our church. 
We got a few things that we try to set up to help you with that. Do you guys know that we have some small groups that meet once a week to study the Bible, share life together, to do these deeper levels of community? If you want to join one of these, we can get you connected. I think there's like a lot of retirees, but I'd love to start one, you know, during non-working hours. Did you guys know that some of our small groups are during like working hours for the most part? Yeah, what are we doing? You're on a farm, you don't count. Um, but if, if you work and you want to be a part of a small group, let us know. We'd love to start one on a weeknight sometime. And what about some people recently started mentoring other people in our church, right? Where you meet regularly with one or two other people in the church. And they do this sharing of life on a regular basis. This one's great because you could do it whenever works for just two people's schedule instead of ten. And we have some events and service opportunities here at the church where you can spend additional time with your fellow believers, get to know them, and also do some good for our community in the process. And church, there's absolutely nothing wrong with standing up after the service today and asking someone if they want to go to lunch, coffee, dinner, maybe a play date with the kids. Or if you don't have kids, like maybe you could babysit their kids while they sleep or go on a date or something, right? The opportunities for deeper community are here for you to engage in. And it's funny because I haven't met anyone in this church who has said, oh, I don't need more of that in my life. Like, I got enough deep community. I haven't heard any of you say that. In fact, kind of the opposite. I feel like I've heard many of you say, I want deeper community. Where was I? There we go. <laughs> Because I think most of us resonate with the statement that life is a little lonely, right, church? And a little too independent, a little too disconnected. And I think we all want that deeper community. Church, if you want to find joy, you got to find your community of fellow believers and dive deep with them. Like Paul, to find your partners in the gospel where you study together, you express love and affection to each other. When you walk through the doors, you know what they've been dealing with all week. And they know what you've been dealing with all week. And when you walk with each other through life, seeing each other grow in your faith, you can find joy with them, no matter what situations you have going on around you. Finally, if you want joy, you have to engage your splachnon. Your splagnon. Yep. Fun Greek word. Splagnon is in verse 8. We'll see it a few more times in the book of Philippians. Paul loves this word, right? And Philippians 1 verses 8 says this. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the splagnon of Jesus Christ. Right? Um, and the NLT version that we read today translated as the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. The word literally means bowels, intestines. Some of us have more of that than others, right? Um, and, and he's saying, like, I long for you with the bowels of Jesus Christ. My intestines, they long for you and love you. I should write Valentine's Day cards, right? This could be great. Like, you go and you get, like, the Christian Valentine's Day cards, and they're all like, oh, may God's tender mercies I love you so much. I'm so glad God gave you. I want one that's like, I love you with my splagnon, right? <laughs> yeah, don't quit my day job. <laughs> It'll be my side hustle on Etsy, right? So <laughs> the bowels, the splagnon in Hebrew culture was also the seat of your deepest emotions. And you know this, right, church? When you feel great joy or happiness or a sense of relief and good things, it rises up within you from your bowels. Your muscles relax. You feel at ease. And likewise, if you're anxious or something difficult happens in life or you get some terrible news, what do we say? You got a knot in your stomach, right? Feel like you're going to throw up. Your breathing gets shallow. We say, I'm going to be sick. It wells up within the deepest parts of you, sits in your guts, and the stress makes your bowels dance, your splagnon, right? Ancient Hebrew people 3,000 years ago knew that emotions, especially the big ones, also involve a bodily response. 
right? Now, the problem with modern Native Americans is we've learned to try and shut that mechanism down, right? To not be ruled by our emotions in an effort to be logical, rational people who are above emotions and in control of them, right? But instead of being in control of them, what we usually do is we just shut that stuff down, right? Dudes really have a problem with this, but women also struggle with this, where the expressions of those deep emotions is frowned upon, right? You don't want to be seen as hysterical. You don't want to lose your man card, right? When a dude starts crying in public, what's the first thing they do? Oh, I'm so sorry, guys, I never do this, right? You're not allowed to show your splagnon in public. We shut it down, and we try to turn it off in America. And then when things come out sideways, we take antidepressants when life gets stressful, right? Because we haven't learned how to deal with that stuff. It overwhelms us. And look, church, it's no knock on meds to help. I take them. Some people have imbalances, and we need those. But some of us have also just learned to suppress things, and then we just cover it up with medicine. And I've had to spend a lot of time in my young adulthood engaging with Engaging with my splagnon, to love deeply, to cry, to feel emotions instead of just stuffing them down and hoping they go away. Because church, if you shut down your gut, if you shut down your emotions and you don't feel them, guess what you're not going to feel? Joy. Gladness. You see Paul fully expressing himself throughout this letter. He uses words like all and always and every time. He's expressing these deep emotions, stresses how much he loves this church of Philippi and how much he longs for them. Dudes, when was the last time you said you longed for someone that didn't involve sex? Right? When was the last time you longed for your fellow dudes? Right? Right? But when Paul operates within these deep emotions, he feels them, lives in them, expresses them to others. He engages his splagnon. And this is his mindset. Did you notice earlier that mindset was in quotes when we talked about joy? Because the mindset is also the bowels. It's not just logic, but it's a whole bodily way of engaging in the world with joy. Paul's not afraid of it. He doesn't shove it down. And to find joy, church, you have to find those deeper emotions. And if you have trouble in this area, a great place to start is to share your bowels in deeper community. I'm loving this, Plagnon. <laughs> Paul loved it too, so it's okay. It's biblical, right? So, someone you regularly go to lunch with because these deeper emotions are best expressed to people that know us well, right? It'd be odd if a stranger in church came up to you and is like, I'm longing for you, Right? What would you do? You'd call the police, right? And that'd probably be appropriate. But deeper community is the right place to engage this part of you. And it's no wonder, church, when we lack deep community, that we suppress this stuff. Or we pay someone to uncover it with us, right? And that's not a knock on therapists. A good therapist will save your life, right? Church, you don't need to express your emotions to every person you meet, but you do need to have some people close in your life who you can engage with this stuff more than your spouse and family. Your spouse is not equipped to deal with your splagnon. At least that's what Kristen tells me. There's so many (laughs) fart and poop jokes here, right? Like, it's great. I love it. You need friends and your fellow believers who you can share your bowels with and a good therapist who never hurts, right? I'm not naming any names in this room, but I'm just saying some therapists might not be a bad idea, right? So, moving on. So as I was reading this passage and working on it, uh, a few things came to mind that I wanted to express thankfulness for. Um, Obviously, Taters and Kristen are here this morning, right? Yeah. And Lily and Noah are somewhere in the church. They're regular PK kids. They run around here like they own it. Noah's like, my dad's the pastor. I can go in there. And it's like, no, that's not how that works, Noah, right? (laughs) And even though they drive me nuts, I long for them whenever I'm away from them for too long, right? And church, how have the past six months been going here at Branch Line? Our church has experienced quite a bit of turmoil in our pursuit of spreading the gospel together. But in that, I've had some joy in seeing each of you step out in faith. Those of you who step into volunteer roles that were opened, I think of 
uh, Brody and Tracy as they took on more within Impact. I've seen Samuel jump into the tech team, and I heard maybe someday soon might even play piano for us. Woo! Yeah. And, and he's, got, he's got a synthesizer from like the 80s, the one where you just press the buttons. Doo, doo, doo. And, and so I'm hoping that comes out one day. And maybe we could get him those like sunglasses with like the little lines through them from like the 80s videos. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Samuel's kind of a shy guy. I probably shouldn't call him out this much, right? <laughs> And, and for the people that were willing to help out during this time, um, people like, uh, let me just look around here, like, Charlie, I'm glad you're feeling a lot better after the whole leg thing, right? He's been getting back into B-Kids and stuff like that when necessary, and we're just glad you're here on a Sunday morning, right? And Paul and Nancy, who stepped in and helped Tim clean the churches, I don't know if you guys knew that, but like some of our newest attenders are helping clean this place. That's amazing. I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. And I'll come into the church, and Carol's got some muffins and some cookies, and oh my God, the kids and I demolish those, right? Yep, Dan, you joined the mission team or the board of overseers team. That's pretty cool. I'm glad to see that. Christine, after much um, wrangling with God, is going to be our next board chairman. Yeah, that's pretty cool, right? We got Dan and Jessica back in the booth. They step back into that. Have been helping out. Jessica's like actually helping to organize the church, which is like very much needed, right? Admin is not my skill set, but she's been doing awesome at that, right? And Tyler stepped in and helped preach, right? And you guys have been enjoying that. I think of Joe and Natalie who have been helping out with our worship team. Guys, they literally dusted off their instruments to relearn them in order to bring you songs, right? And I've especially been enjoying Joe who seemed like more of a behind the scenes guy prior to that, right? And now it's been awesome to hear him up here and hear his country twang, right? Have you guys caught that in our worship? I told him we're going to do some bluegrass later, right? And Bill and you got called in. Sue's been having you help out in more <laughs> back in B Kids. And Sue's been running the scheduling, right? And Ashley, you stepped up and you joined our hospitality team with that big yeah. smile of yours. And we're awesome that you're here, right? Yeah. And, and I know John Langenfeld, he, he cleaned out our garage, like, back in September or October. And he was asking me questions, and I was like, bro, I don't know, just do whatever you want with it. Like, that's not my forte, right? Yeah, and Brody's been stepping up with impact and things like that. And we've just been seeing all of these volunteers and all these people rise up to the occasion, right? But it's not about being grateful for your gift, guys. It's about being grateful that we're all partners in the gospel together, yeah. right? Yeah. The joy in it is not so much, oh, we're making the church function. That's like whatever. Because our primary purpose and mission is to make the church function so that new people come to know Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing things. That's what brings joy, right? Now, I haven't thanked everyone. I'm sorry if I missed your name. But just know, I have been so thankful this week thinking about these things. And I've also been thankful for the impact students I've gotten to know. we got a few with us. Peyton, Jackie, yeah, Samuel, yep. They've gotten to know my weird personality. It is not Zach's. <laughs> but God bless them, they've accepted me, I think. I don't know what they say in their text chats, right? But it's been fun to realize how old I am, Right? Tracy and I were quoting the movie Dodgeball this past week, and we looked at Samuel and we're like, do you know that movie? And he looked at us like we were crazy. It's probably like how my parents looked at me when I was his age about some Elvis song. I'm like, I don't know who Elvis is. Isn't he that old dude, right? And then they, you know, grounded me, right? <laughs> or how the students told me that we weren't studying the Bible enough. Like, oh my God, that warmed my heart to hear that. Like, you never have impact students say those things. And church, I'm joyful for everyone who comes through our door when they wouldn't feel welcome elsewhere. We've been hearing some of that. Whether it's an addiction they have, or prison time, or divorce, or they're struggling to find a job. What a joy it is to see you join us. Find a place where you can experience the love of Jesus. And I get to see you grow in your faith. Volunteer in areas. Get deeper into community with this church. And then you turn around and you accept those same people into our community. You talk about joy despite our circumstances. 
You guys show me what faith really means when you approach it with all that crud going on in your life. And it's beautiful. We don't need people who, need the, who have their life together here at this church, right? I mean, it'd be good if some of us did, but for the most part, we don't need people who have their life together. We need people who yearn and long for Jesus and find joy in helping others find that Jesus. I love messy people, and the faith they show is inspirational to me and brings joy to me. I'm thankful and filled with joy because of you, because of this community, and I give thanks to God that he allowed me to be a partner with you in spreading this gospel. And church, I think the best way that we can celebrate this joy of ours is to celebrate communion together. So I'm going to invite our communion helpers up. I think it's Dan, right? And I recruited Natalie. Is that good? You guys got to wear the food service gloves. They're right there on the thing. <laughs> yep. Put the gloves on. <laughs> there you go. Um, don't play the wedding march. We're going to have issues. I don't, unless it's like the father giving them away. Joe, you got to come next with maybe Christine, Armin. Kidding. <laughs> focus. Focus. We're doing communion, guys. Focus. Because um, communion, right, is the remembrance of what Jesus did, the thing that actually binds us all together. Communion is the way that Jesus' church remembers how he went to the cross. He died for our sins. He was resurrected, and he created a way for us to have joy and confidence. As Paul says, that when Jesus returns, his work in us will be completed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, Paul wrote this, and he says to the Corinthians, For I pass on to you, what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, in agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Church, in a moment, we're going to play two songs. They're not worship sing-along songs. If you know them, you can. But they're time for you to spend in contemplation. And here's what I want you to do during that time. For the first song, I want you to take time to confess the ways in which you've missed out on joy. Right? Maybe it's a lack of being thankful. Maybe it's getting away from your purpose in life. Maybe it's a lack of community or shutting down your emotions. But confess to God. So all the ways that we've forgotten to focus on what does Jesus want us to do here in this earth. And then, church, I want you to reflect on what you're thankful for today. Right? What you're joyful for. And I want us to give thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ who brought us together, who created a way for us, no matter our circumstances, and who gives us the ultimate joy of knowing our future is secure in God's house for us, no matter what happens here on this earth. Let's pray. Father, as we come before your table, as we remember your son's sacrifice, how his body was broken, how his blood was shed to make a way for us. We confess all the ways that life has gotten away from us. We confess all the ways in which we've lacked the joy that you want us to have, the purpose, the community that you called us to. And Father, we just are so thankful for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, that you as our Father continues to walk with us and guide us and remind us and forgive us and love us. And Father, we want you to know that we are thankful for everything. We don't say it enough to you or to each other, but Father, we are thankful. And we pray that we would be a thankful people that you would open up to us your joy despite our circumstances, 
for us to be a beacon of your hope, your life, your grace, your peace in this world. And Father, we know that that comes from your spirit guiding us in all things. Father, we pray that your spirit would move among us, that we would be gospel messengers to the people in our community, not just in words, but in our deeds and how we find joy and how we express our love for everyone. Father, we pray that settles deep within us, creates a bodily response in us. And Father, we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.